And he pulled me aside and he said, look at the look on her face. He's like, that tells you right there, like sick versus not sick. Like what an experience that was to, you know, see this freak accident. Like the day was all going great. They were having fun, just jumping off cliffs, you know. And now this happened and this, this could potentially be catastrophic. From PAStartup.co, this is the PA Startup Podcast, a podcast dedicated to helping pre-PA students, current PA students, and new grads start their careers as physician assistants. I'm Chris Darst, and on today's show, a day in the life of an emergency medicine PA. This is my friend, Teresa Broder, who you might remember from two episodes ago, episode number 27, where we had talked about PA residencies. Uh, Teresa attended a residency program in California for emergency medicine and then came back here to the Midwest to uh, work in the emergency room. So that previous conversation was excellent, and I was excited to get that out to you. Uh, But we also continued on to talk about her current job. She has so much good information in here, so I hope you will uh, be able to listen to the whole episode from start to finish. Um, And for those of you out there who would like to support the PA Startup Podcast, don't forget we have a free 30-day Audible trial at pastartup.co slash audible, where you can choose an audiobook of your choice free for 30 days. If you cancel before the 30 days, the book is yours to keep, uh, but uh, that helps keep the podcast going. Also hit up the website, pastartup.co. We've got lots of resources. We've got the SA workbook. We've got uh, free downloads for resumes and cover letters. Uh, we've got some PA Startup swag as well, so you can look good in some t-shirts. Uh, you can get some stickers to put on your laptop or your window or something like that. So definitely check us out, pastartup.co. And uh, yeah, let's get into the conversation with Teresa Broder and her uh, day in the life of emergency medicine. So, Teresa, oh, we've talked um, on a previous episode about your residency and your experience in the ER and stuff like that, but we never got to your your current day job. Knowing that you came from a residency, tell me about like the progression of your jobs and how they were different in your role as a PA, and then bring me up to today, like what you're doing now. Mm-hmm. So, I have worked in the emergency room. Obviously, during the residency, we were doing 12-hour shifts, and you know, you're going the entire 12 hours, really no time for a lunch break or anything. Mm -hmm. Um, And then when I moved up to Northern California in Modesto, we did 10 hour shifts. Um, And that was more, you know, we moved through the provider and triage, the more fast track. Um, And then we were working in the main ED as well. And now my job is we do nine hour shifts, um, come in usually eight to five, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. or uh, 5 p.m. to 2 a.m. Okay. And throughout the day, the 8 to 5 is staffed with another physician and then either a physician and a mid-level PA Mm -hmm. or NP. We use both in the ER. Okay. And so you're working with that person and I don't know what they call that. You can edit this part, but where one person comes in and then like an hour later, another person. Oh, like staggered shift yeah. type thing. Okay. So we have staggered shifts. So the, um, I come in at eight, the physician has previously come in at seven and then we have somebody that comes in at nine to cover the busiest part of the day. Okay. So Which that, is nine to five, something like yeah, that. Yeah. Nine okay. to five is a good bet. Um, so that princess shift is from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. Okay. And so we do have the opportunity to pick those up as extra shifts throughout the month if mm. you want to do more. Okay. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> so from eight to five, you're essentially just seeing whatever comes in. I mean, you're in the main ED, everyone works in that same area. And so, you know, the physician will pick up someone, you'll pick up the next person. And then the other mid-level or physician, whoever's covering that princess shift will pick somebody up. Okay. It just kind of rotates back like that. Let's say there's somebody that's really high acuity, you know, they may miss the turn on picking up a patient. Mm -hmm. Um, But we essentially just, if there's somebody waiting, you'll, and you're free, then you pick it up. Just grab the next one. Is there a limit to the number of people you can have at once? No. Probably not. There's a lot of beds in that (laughs) ER too. (laughs) So there's three providers in there at, at the most. Is that correct? Yes. And at times there's only one because between 2 a.m. and 7 a.m. there's there's Correct. just 
one physician. physician. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, what's your favorite shift to work? You know, I like the variety. I Mm -hmm. like working both. Um, eight to five is fine. Uh, Most days at East, you're just getting slammed. Yeah. Um, five to two, I would say at West, West campus is less busy. You see a lot of drunks. Um, you Mm -hmm. see a lot of, you know, I don't know, mental health, Tons yeah. of mental health patients. Tell me real quick about just the difference between the campuses. So our East Campus is, I guess, yeah, the designated cardiac center. And then we do pediatrics there as well. Okay. So if somebody needs the cardiac catheterization lab, they'll go to East. If you think that they're actually having a STEMI, mm-hmm. they'll usually go to East. Um, pediatrics, anything that needs to get admitted for pediatrics will go to East. Um, women's health, East. Okay. Uh, West is designated trauma center and then more mental health. They have that mental health. Mental health center. Triage. Yeah. Yep. Oh, wait, that's right. There's a separate triage. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, I bet there is a difference in what you see at different hours of the day in each of those places. Very true. So eight to five is the busy, busy time. What do you normally see in the ER? Like, I know there's a range. I know there's a, but what's like typical. So at East, we kind of joke that even the pediatric patient that comes in with, you know, fever or an earache, this person either has some type of peg tube or, you know, they've had a prior heart surgery or they're sick kids that come in. Um, but it's always nice to just have the, okay, this is a fever. Oh, you have, you know, otitis media. Okay. Yeah. This is good. Yeah. But, uh, I don't know. We see everything from cough, cold, lacerations, um, Lots of little old ladies falling right now on Coumadin. <laughs> oh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> that come to East and then have to be transferred to West. Yeah, as a trauma. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's also a trauma center over there. So we, yep. yeah. And what, what classifies a trauma? Just curious. Do you know? Is it like a fall from a height? Is it a, I mean. So fall from a certain height, um, motor vehicle accident at a certain speed. Okay. Um, whether or not they're wearing their seatbelt, were they um, ejected from the vehicle? Is there a. Uh, intrusion of the compartment another passenger death in the same vehicle that they were in Ooh, yikes. uh drownings categorizes uh traumas Ooh. what else um yeah a lot fall, of stuff. even like a ground level fall with a head injury on anticoagulation sure when i was in general surgery we covered trauma call general surgery basically mm-hmm. and i had to carry a pager with me and i was always scared to death it was going to go off cuz i was like a new grad didn't really had never really been in the ER except for like appendicitis, uh-huh. you know, like rarely went in there. And I was home one night and it went off and I panicked. So I called the surgeon. I was like, ah, we just got a text for trauma. And he's like, we'll go see what it is. And I was like, oh my gosh. And I go in there and I'm getting like little bits. This is back in the day before like texting was popular. And so it was like a, a pager that had a, like a screen on it with a readout. And I was getting little bits and it was like, um, um, however, 46 year old male, um, cycle accident which i didn't know if that was motorcycle accident oh, bicycle okay. accident. i didn't know i had no idea and so i walk in there just panicked that they're going to look to me to do something i have no idea what to do and i get in there and this guy's totally fine and i was like what happened and he's like i was trying to show my kid how to ride off a curb and i fell i mean it was not a big deal at Come all on. and i was like oh thank goodness yeah <laughs> Because I was like, I don't know what to do in this situation. But you really never know. Those yeah. chief complaints, I mean, fall and you can, you know, be completely surprised. You walk into the room nonchalant, like, okay, this is going to be okay. And the patient's, you know, yeah. bleeding from somewhere or actively trying to die on you. And oh, my so goodness. that's the excitement of emergency medicine. Yeah. And it's, <laughs> and you, you can leave that room and go to a room where someone's like, my wrist has been hurting for oh. a week. And you're like, Okay, hold on. Oh, a week? Yeah. Usually we get the six years of oh. abdominal pain. We've seen five specialists. Yeah. Can yeah. you please tell me today what is going on? Yeah, and you decided to come to the ER at 10 o'clock on Saturday night yeah. to find this out. Okay, solid. Yeah. A lot of people use ERs as primary care, which Correct. is too bad because it's not good use of medical dollars or your time, actually. So um, so, uh, so you kind of take what we were talking about, the, the flow of the day. So, the, so you take what comes up. Um, how does that like honestly work? Like someone comes into the, the waiting room, they tell somebody their chief complaint, how does the patient work their way through? How do you, at what point do you take over? What's the first thing you do when you get in the room? Tell us about that. 
Okay. So they come in and they are triaged by the nurse. They have their chief complaint and then they get their vital signs taken. And depending on if our beds are full in the ER, they might wait in the waiting room or, you know, if they're, let's say, diaphoretic, having chest pain, Mm -hmm. they might be rushed right back. Um, There are techs in the ER too. So the techs will get the EKG. Um, The nurse a lot of times will just have the intuition to start the IV, um, you know, put the patient on the monitor. Um, and then depending on their little levels of acuity that come up and a five is the least serious, let's say they've had a cold for the past couple days and they need a note to return to work. We get that. Wow. Sometimes people come to the ER for that. Super easy. Oh man. Um, And then they're like, oh, by the way, you know, we have abdominal pain, too. So we need a note to return to work. And then can we get a CT scan, too? (laughs) Can we have an MRI of the brain that takes five hours? Oh, no. Oh, no. (laughs) So um, are you obligated to do something about that if they complain about it? To address it or to write in your medical decision making why you're going to order that test or why you're not going to order that test or, you know, if they think that they might have something wrong with their brain, do they have follow-up? Are they talking to their primary doctor? Have they already been seen by their primary doctor? So you kind of have to work through the medical decision-making of this is what their complaint is, this is what their fear was, but these are the 10 reasons why I don't think that they have gotcha. what they're saying that they have. So Yeah, just document it. Mm-hmm. And, and then there's always follow-up too, right? Just mm-hmm. you know, follow up with your primary doctor if they have one. Yep. Um, okay. All right. Sorry, I interrupted you. So, uh, so you've got five is the lowest acuity Mm -hmm. and then work your way up from there. Like what, what else do you see? That's a four, three, two, or a one. So, uh, four might be a simple laceration or a chief complaint of a fever and they've already given ibuprofen or Tylenol and they come in and they have no fever and really mom's like, well, they're just not acting right. You know? So that might be a four is like, okay, they, they seem pretty good or, um, you know, a little kid who fell from like a foot and mom, they hit their head. They haven't mm-hmm. lost consciousness. They're not vomiting. Mom thinks, oh, we just wanted to get them checked out to make sure yep. they're okay. Oh yeah. That could be a four. Okay. You know, you got to do your physical exam. The kid looks really good. They're smiling. They're, you know, texting on mom's iPhone. Like, okay, yeah, this kid's totally games or something. Fine. Yeah. yeah. Um, three might be, uh, maybe, uh, cough, maybe their vital signs are slightly abnormal. You know, you're thinking they could have a PE, they could have pneumonia. Um, Two is usually uh, if they come in and they're, you know, they're diaphoretic, they have a significant cardiac history, they have chest pain, um, maybe some EKG changes if they've already done the EKG, okay, they'll make them a level two. And then a one is someone who comes in that's they're coding. EMS has already brought them in and they're coding. Or, yeah. Gotcha. Life threatening. Blood loss, coding. Get in the door now and you need, yeah, you yeah. need to be seen. So. Wow. Okay. Do you get in on a lot of those? Try to at least even go in and watch. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We just had, we had an overdose uh, last night that, you know, I don't always jump in on those patients that are unresponsive, just overdosed, but I try to at least as the primary provider, I won't go in there and jump right in and say, Hey, I can handle this. Sure. I really have no idea what I'm doing, but you know, let me get my feet wet. But I'll, last night I went in to at least watch what they do. Um, let's give some Narcan and see if that turns them around. Yeah. He woke right up and started puking. So oh, that was solid. Good. Excellent. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's, I think, I don't know if I've talked about this on the podcast, but, um, Anytime you're learning something new, if if you only stay in your comfort zone, you never step outside of it, you never grow. But if you constantly put yourself in positions that are outside your comfort zone, you do end up, now your comfort zone grows bigger and bigger. So going into those sorts of things, I was just talking about it with um, a new hire about codes, you know, when someone's coding. Um, my joke is you always want to be the second person to the code. (laughs) So, so that everyone doesn't look at you and say, what do we do now? Um, but to be there and to be part of it and things is great experience because you can, you know, our, our joke in, in my group is, well, we're all guys and we all like to work out. And so we're going to do chest compressions because, Mm -hmm. (laughs) because we can, but everybody else, the smarter people can be pushing the drugs and stuff like that to actually physically be there with a actual person coding, so different or drug overdose or someone that's, you know, exsanguinating from an injury, you know, like that's, you can't get that experience any other way. Mm-hmm. So, so good for you. Good for going in there. And I'm glad they woke up and sorry, they puked. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. So that's kind of what drew me to emergency medicine is what scares me the most. What could I do that 
would be so completely out of my comfort zone and it was emergency medicine. And so no to kidding. kind of, you know, slowly get my feet wet and kind of have my hand held at the beginning was why, you know, I thought the residency would be the good way to go. Yeah, for sure. So, so that was what you were worried about. I mean, it was this in PA school that you're saying like, yeah. this would be overwhelming. What could scare me? Yeah. What could I possibly, how could I be the best? And, yeah. you know, grow the most, have the most growth as a PA, get the most out of it. That's perfect. I mean, that's, that's terrifying. literally, yeah, it is terrifying, <laughs> but that's literally p- pushing yourself outside of your comfort zone. Yep. Every shift, every patient, every chart you pick up or open now, mm-hmm. um, is an opportunity to be pushed. And I think, you know, I've been in cardiac surgery for 10 years. I, it would be, it would be difficult for me to think of those five differential diagnoses, let alone the 15, mm-hmm. you know, cause in my world, I usually have an echo, a heart cath, CT scan. I usually have some diagnostic test that's been worked up that before I even go see them, I know what the plan's going to be. Mm-hmm. And I think I'm probably not as good of a provider because of it, because you've got to, I mean, you got to be up on everything. So that's impressive. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So one of the really important things too is that I go into those overdoses or I push myself on those patients when the doctor is there so I can watch what's happening because there have been shifts where this just happened two weeks ago I was working with one of the doctors he came in at seven I came in at eight and there was already a level one like or a, um, acuity one code that he was coding there was a stroke alert that was just coming in there was another person with chest pain that was so he's already busy right and I'm the only person there right so you need to know those things because there are going to be other things happening. And so you might be the only one, yeah. you know, you always have that tax. Like I could have gone in and said, Hey, what should I do in this situation? But like, he's busy. Yeah. Is that the right time to do that? Yeah, to, right. to be like, hey, excuse me. Hey, I know you're, can you just take a break from yeah. <laughs> doing compressions? And, right. Yeah. Yeah. Holy cow. So what, how did that turn out? Turned out. Okay. It was a very busy <laughs> morning. <sighs> Was that the but beginning of your shift? That was the very beginning. Set the tone for yeah. the rest of the shift. I, I came in at eight and there were three to be seen. And then that stroke was called. And yeah, I mean, that was crazy. Yeah. But it, you have to make it work. Yeah, totally. And that's, and that's why you put yourself in those situations. That's good. And we have phenomenal nursing, honestly. I mean, that's those important. nurses are good. And it's happened before where I go into the room and they're like, well, we can't find the doc. So will you get into bed one because they're unresponsive and they need you now. Yeah. And you get in there and you're like, Oh, uh, what do I do? Yeah. You know, you freeze for a second. Okay. You check your own pulse. And then you're like, <laughs> and they're like, Oh, do you want to check a blood sugar? Yeah. That sounds like a great idea. Oh, oh, isn't that great? oh it's 30. Oh, okay. Yeah. What now should we do? Some, yeah. Nursing. Okay. So to the listeners out there, we touched on this in the episode about residencies, but, um, Sometimes people treat you like crap, right? And you want to try to pull rank on them or you want to, you know, you want to, your pride gets hurt or something like that. But then there's the flip side, which is you need to be humble because there's a lot of nurses out there. There's a lot of other PAs or or physicians that know more than you. And so my trick was when I was new, you know, in the ICU, they'd come up and they'd be like, they'd rattle something off. I would have no idea what they were even saying. And I'd be like, well, what do you think we should do? And they're like, well, we should start epinephrine. I'm like, fantastic. <laughs> Let's right. do that. Yeah. And then over time, you're like, you think of it before they do, you know? So uh, find the trustworthy ones and definitely listen to them. So just a little tip. So. Yeah. A little <laughs> tidbit that I heard too was that if the nurse isn't concerned, you should maybe still be concerned, do your evaluation. But if the nurse is concerned, you should be concerned. If they don't want to send the patient home because they're sick, Listen to yeah. them. Yeah, they've probably, there's a reason for that. Yeah, yeah. Huh. yeah. Yep. That's cool. Um, so so you, we talked about your shift and things. Um, what um, what kind of stuff, like procedures and things do you think? I mean, we talked about suturing and, and mm-hmm. stuff like that, but you talked about intubation, you talked about lumbar punctures. Um, what all kinds of procedure stuff do you get to do? So, yeah, lacerations, I mean, daily, um, joint reductions, whether or not, uh, it's just a hematoma block, which is where you do a uh, lidocaine under the skin, you know, into the fracture basically, and then reduce the fracture Holy splinting, crap. um, uh, arthrocentesis, which is, mm-hmm. you know, fluid off of a joint, yeah. specifically the knee. We do, uh, lumbar punctures, mm-hmm. um, central lines, you know, I'm working on being proctored in those so that I'll be 
hopefully someday credentialed for it. Yeah. So we need so many um, supervised center lines and then um, intubations. You know, I've had a handful since I've been working here. So that's cool. It's always cool. Yeah. Now, has your have your responsibilities changed based on where you work? I mean, we talked about fast track and stuff, but you mentioned the per diem. Mm-hmm. Um, tell me about the differences. Do, are, do, are you doing more now than you've ever done before? Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. More now than, yeah, I did in California. I mean, during the residency, obviously, there were always procedures to be had since mm-hmm. we were so busy. Because you're, you're fighting for the, the mm-hmm. opportunity to do them and things like that. But is your job unique, I guess, is my question. Is it is it unique in what you get to do um, in this region that you know of? Or is it pretty typical that a PA in emergency medicine would get to kind of be in the trenches with the physicians and, and take whatever's coming. You know, this is the opportunity that I've always been looking for was Mm -hmm. to work alongside the doctors, have a really good relationship, be able to work in the same, you know, little cubicle with them, the same doc box, we call it. Yeah. And, um, bounce ideas off. Hey, this person just came in with this. What do you think about this EKG or what do you think about this workup? Or do you think I should, you know, add on a dimer. The answer is probably no, (laughs) (laughs) but, um, (laughs) so it's nice to just be able to have that collegiality, I guess, camaraderie, um, versus the other sites that I had previously worked at where it's like, this is the PA area and you guys need to be able to handle that. Mm -hmm. And this is the doc area and don't come back here unless you really need something. Oh, wow. Yeah. Solid. That is a work environment. Yeah. Yeah. Um, cool. Now tell me about your practice. So you're, uh, you work in a hospital, but it's not hospital owned. Is that correct? Correct. So So you're privately owned like a a physician group. It is a physician group. Um, so yeah, we work with, um, I think 19 or 20 different physicians and then nine or 10, uh, PAs and nurse practitioners. Okay. Now with the number of it's two campuses, you don't go anywhere else, right? That's just the two. Um, and there's only one physician per shift. Is that right? There's a physician that comes on from seven to three and then another one that comes on at two thirty, mm-hmm. and then one that comes on at four and then someone that comes on at 11 o'clock at night. So okay. the 11 to seven, they do the eight hour shift at night. So it's an hour less, but it's nights. So right. that's how they kind of get okay. around that. So, cause there's 19 in the group, mm-hmm. but I guess everyone's got vacation. So someone could be mm-hmm. out of town or something like that. Um, how does, um, how does that work? Like days off, how many shifts a week do you work? So I do 15 shifts a month. I'm glad you brought this up. This okay. is awesome. This is my favorite part about the job. So 15 shifts a month and however that works out, if I need a week off, then I just ask for that week off and then my 15 shifts are split throughout the rest of the month. Oh, I gotcha. don't ever have to, you know, get paid time off or take quote vacation, I guess. Okay. Um, it's just, they arrange those 15 shifts. However, you're able to do it. So then there's no, as long as you get your 15 shifts, the rest of the time is up to you. Correct. You can pick up those extra shifts if you want, yes. right? Um, for extra pay, mm-hmm. I assume. Is there a difference in the pay rate if you get, if you get more than 15 shifts? You just get a certain amount per hour. I'm just whatever, sure what whatever your hourly rate is. Okay. Mm-hmm. So there's no limit really. As long as you get your 15 shifts, you can do what you want. So you can CrossFit, right? I can CrossFit, yes. <laughs> Multiple times a day. We were talking about that before I started recording. So, um, Okay, so 15 shifts a month. Um, do you like to do them all kind of in a row and then have a big chunk of time off? Or do you like working, being off, working, being off? What's your preference? So I really get kind of grumpy <laughs> working more than like four shifts in a row. It's just a lot yeah. to... Um, Stressful. Super stressful. Yeah. Yeah. So I found that after, you know, four days, I'm just not the nicest human being to be around. Um, So I really would prefer to do, you know, two or three days at a time, have even one day off to just decompress, get some laundry done, Mm -hmm. CrossFit, (laughs) whatever it may be. Right. Um, But I also really like to travel. So this whole month has been, it seems like almost no days off because I have an entire week off coming up. That's awesome. So it's, you know give and take, you really have to kind of suffer through 
you know, all those shifts all at once, Mm -hmm. but then you get the benefit of, Hey, I have a whole week off. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. cool. That's nice that it's flexible and things. Mm -hmm. Um, who does your schedule? Do you, is it like a one person kind of took, it takes all the requests and balances it out or is there a computer program that does it or how's that work? So the lead PA does our schedule. We give him our requests and he has it out. I mean, he's, super good at it about a month and a half in advance so we can plan anything that we need to and he takes the requests throughout the whole year so really um we put down a request we put the date that we've requested it and then if someone's already requested off that weekend it's not necessarily that we won't be able to get it off but he might need to kind of move things around and he tries to make it fair with everyone working the same amount of weekends Um, Mm -hmm. and the holidays are all set so i already know the holidays that i'm going to be working for the next like two or three years yeah. just because that's all on rotation. So sure. I'll know if I'm working Christmas or Thanksgiving and yeah. Ahead of time. Yeah, that's yeah. good. That's what we did in our office. I, I do the schedule and I'm, I try to, everyone's got the same, um, same amount of call nights and things like that. You know, mm-hmm. weekends should be even and stuff like that. So, um, I was hoping that you were going to say there's some software program that made it super easy cause <laughs> it's a pain in the butt, but, yeah. um, but I like doing it cause it does. I like to, work it out for everybody's favor. So, um, cool. So what's the craziest thing you've ever been part of in the ER anywhere? Gosh. Um, I guess going back to that sick, not sick. So working on my PA, uh, rotation, my first emergency medicine rotation in PA school, there was a girl who had come in and they were cliff jumping and she came in with a piece of like tree basically lodged into her chest oh, cavity no. and the i mean her heart rate was elevated obviously her blood pressure was down so we had no idea where this piece of wood was going so yeah. we did get her to the um, ct scanner but we had to go down with her because are you gonna crump in the ct scanner yeah. is always a big risk Holy cow. um and then you know stabilized her and ultimately helicopter flew were down to the trauma center but my supervising physician pulled me aside as you know all the chaos was happening and they were preparing for you know intubation central line and all of this happening and he pulled me aside and he said look at the look on her face he's like that tells you right there like sick versus not sick like what an experience that was to you know see this freak accident like the day was all going great they were having fun just jumping off cliffs you know and now this happened and this this could potentially be catastrophic and to be able to take a step back and say okay this person really needs help now yeah. this isn't one of those that can just wait out in the ear even though her boyfriend's like oh i think she'll be fine you know we may have been drinking a little bit and she got Typical like a dude. little yeah. a little twig in her side no this is like a huge come on law yeah. through her chest yeah like, he's but, like i'm gonna be in trouble yeah oh, no <laughs> yeah. they're gonna find out that i was drinking yeah her parents are gonna kill me yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're never gonna be able to go on another date yeah. that's pretty wild what else i bet you've got some crazy stories i do what else what else you got so during our uh, emergency medicine residency we did a rotation with the correctional facility in um i don't know southern california and guys are obsessed with like putting things into the skin of their penis not only so sounding is what they call it when you basically try to put things in your urethra and stretch it cannulate i don't know it's called what sounding okay there's a term just fyi i did not know that okay so let's (laughs) be real clear (laughs) <laughs> I'm not familiar with that term. So, <laughs> Sounding. So that's and that's putting stuff, that's basically like catheterizing yourself yes. with something. Yes. I've heard of that. To you know? stretch it. I don't know if it has some status symbol or something, like the bigger the urethra, the better. But okay. <laughs> I'm not sure. But people will also like cut the skin of their penis and put like chest pieces and other things in there. And we would have to see them in, it was just essentially a clinic. Okay. And take the pieces out or because they'd get infected. They had no clean way to cut their skin and put these things in there. What's the, I'm again, this is not a a practice I'm familiar with. I don't, I don't do this, but why? I mean, it's not, is it a correctional facility in that like they're trying to smuggle things in and that's where they're hiding it? Or is this a mental issue that they're doing this? Like, why are they? I think it's not debatable that there's a mental issue happening, but well, it's just yeah, essentially... I, I it's, would hope so. It's pleasure, I guess. Really? Yeah. I'm going to beg to differ on that <laughs> one, but... Okay. Okay. Chess pieces. Yep. So you'd have to... 
irrigate things out and then pack the wound or did you close it or what we do you do? Never closed it. We would just uh, try to make the smallest incision possible and then just get it out. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Deliver. It's like delivering a baby. Yeah. Like delivering a <laughs> chest piece from a man's. Uh, which one wow. are we going to get? <laughs> What's oh, it going to be? Oh man. I, I hope it's a pawn. Pawn. And not the, not <laughs> the smallest. <laughs> not the king. Uh, uh, okay. Mm-hmm. Sounds good. Um, Boy, that's kind of like drawing the short straw, having to. I mean, it's interesting. Yeah. Those yeah. those situations are interesting. We had an inmate that would. Um, how did this work? He would somehow get a hold of a wire, mm-hmm. like a like the a cable TV cord, mm-hmm. strip all this stuff out of it, and somehow work it through his chest into his heart, and multiple times. This was not just once. This was multiple times because it got him a trip out of uh-huh. wherever he was, and. Um, I mean, it was a problem because clearly it's going through a ventricle, you know, it's inside the heart. You have to go and bypass to get it out. I mean, it was a mess, but I have no idea That's what crazy. the, I mean, that was not pleasure. That was just, I think manipulating the system is what that was, but they'll um, do anything to get out of there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do you get many inmates and things to, oh, to he, the, here? Yeah. We yeah. see quite a few. Okay. All right. Um, all right. Well, I, not that you can top that. Any other stories you, you want to tell me? What else? Um, Between the the stick through the side and stuff. people like to put things in their rectums quite frequently. We see tons of tampons that have been left for oh, I bet days, weeks, months. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So does are people pretty forthcoming about why they're there, or are they like super aloof until you get alone in the room with them and then they tell you what happened? Oh, so I kind of make that a strategy to just sit down at the bedside and really say, Hey, what, what happened? What's really going on? What's going on? on? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I'm not the cops. I'm not going to, what did you take? What have you used? Yep. You know, did you use it IV or have you, you know, done anything? What other, what other things do I need to know about? Is there anything you want to add to the story? To what do I know? Right. You know, is there some other way that something else that I can like (laughs) get out of you that will help me to figure it out? Sure. So I'm just here to help. Are they pretty, once you give them that Mm -hmm. spiel, are they still on the fence or are they? Sometimes. Yeah. We had this guy come in with bilateral shoulder dislocations. (laughs) It's a bad day. (laughs) How odd. And I never got the. I bet it was CrossFit. (laughs) CrossFit. That's what it was. Yep. Clean and jerk went went really wrong. You're like, I know this guy. (laughs) Oh yeah. I saw him this morning. No. So. I mean, I don't know if he was in handcuffs or something really weird must have been happening for that to just, but he was in there with two other friends and no one was giving up any information. Like the whole story was that just spontaneously, huh. <laughs> yeah. just, that happens all just the time. bilaterally <laughs> dislocated. All the other um, providers that I was working with that day, they're like, no, we've never seen bilateral dislocations. That's wow. just weird. So, it's weird. and you never got the story? Never got the story. Oh, that would have been an excellent story. I, bet. I know. It would have been a really good one. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've heard about people putting things in their rectum. Okay. And there was a colorectal surgeon that was here. And he said, I don't give a crap if you do it. Just tie a string onto it. Because <laughs> he was tired of getting them out. Because right. literally they have to go in. If you can't get it from below, mm-hmm. you have to make an incision in the abdomen yep. and go squeeze it out from above. Mm-hmm. which is Or surgically remove it by cutting the intestine open, which is a, always a, not a good thing. So... Um, yeah, listeners, don't do any of these things <laughs> unless you want to be on the podcast someday. Um, what don't you like about your job? Let's talk about that for a second. Is there anything, and maybe not your job specifically, but emergency medicine, is there anything that is a, a drawback? So I think one of the parts of emergency medicine that's always nice is that we try to see things and fix them. And there's that immediate satisfaction. Today's day and age is so kind of obsessed with things happening now. Immediately. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And there are a lot of things that we see that are not going to get resolved in the, you know, two, three hours that they're in the ER. We can fix the pain, but we always kind of need to talk about realistic expectations. Hey, your pain has been a 10 out of 10 for weeks. We're going to try to get it down to a seven. So we'll help you. But we kind of need to have that discussion up front. Like, it's not going to be a zero. Yeah. So that's one drawback of, you know, the things we can't fix because they're essentially chronic. Mm -hmm. Um, It's unfortunate the things that people have really done to themselves and then kind of come into the ER as a last-ditch effort. Like, hey, I'm actively dying. 
can you fix me? And to reverse a problem that has been, you know, 50 years down the road, you've never had health care, you've smoked like a chimney for your entire life, and to just have them come in and say, hey, can you fix me? It's a huge task, and it's kind of disappointing that you can't do more. Mm -hmm. My least favorite um, is that I only see the acute side of something. You know, somebody comes in, and they're, you know, 70 years old, and they have vaginal bleeding, and you diagnose them with uterine cancer, and you have that rapport in the ER, and, you know, you may end up crying with the family or whatever. This is such a sad situation that you have to tell them, you know, it looks like you have a huge mass and, oh man, but you don't see the other side of that. You know, how does their care progress? Where right. does it go from here? Yeah. So that was one of the parts that in emergency medicine, I was like, well, I don't want to develop a relationship with my patients. I never want to see anybody again. I want to fix it and they'll be done. Yeah. But, um, I don't really feel that way anymore. Like I kind of want to see something through to the end. Kind of the resolution of yeah. the issue. Yeah. yeah. I bet that is hard. Um, our surgical techs in the operating room always say that. They're like, we never know what happens. Mm -hmm. Like how did that guy from Tuesday do? Like, oh, he did great. Like, oh, well, that's good. You know, like it was a save. You know, we're coding on the way into the OR and then they go home four days later. And you're right. like, whoa, wow, that was that was awesome. But they never get that part. So it's probably the mm -hmm. same thing that you're saying. Is there a lot of turnover in ER just because it is so intense? Do you feel like there's a lot of people that get burnt out after a while? I think nursing turnover, there's a bunch. Yes. Okay. Um, physician turnover. I mean, it is one of the highest rates of burnout, mm -hmm. um, emergency medicine, family medicine, pretty high mm -hmm. rates of burnout. But, um, I think if you can, develop a good network of people that can help to prevent burnout. There are certainly those old, there are certainly the old crotchety uh, doctors that, you know, you get on shift with them and you're like, oh man. Yeah. This is <laughs> like, going to be a long day. Yeah. yeah. For sure. I mean, nothing positive comes out of their mouth, but you need to, I kind of make it my challenge to like not be that person that's, you know, the morning person when, you know, no one's had their coffee yet. And, <laughs> but just to kind of, you know, tell a joke or, you know, build that rapport with the person, I guess, to kind of pull them out of that. Like, this isn't the worst thing. It could be way worse. Yeah. Like you're, you have a job, you have money. This isn't, we're helping people. We're here for a purpose versus right. like the patient is coming in to inconvenience me. Right. If you look at <laughs> it that way, yeah. you're never going to be happy. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. If you, yeah, if you're there for a purpose to, to help or to, you know, try to enrich some situation for that patient that's a lot more uh, gratifying than I can't believe I'm on shift and they came in today. Like, Absolutely. Hmm, yeah. Okay. I wanted to sit here and read my book and like <laughs> they're inconveniencing me because they just checked in. Yeah, for that's sure. A terrible attitude. Oh man. Uh, so tell me, what would you tell yourself at the, at graduation? What advice would you give yourself? Uh, if you could go back and talk to the Teresa graduating school, what would you tell her? Okay. So I she made notes. notes on this I one. like it. Yeah. So <laughs> this says, <laughs> chill. Uh, you don't have to be amazing right out of school. Good so point. I don't think I'm a very chill person. <laughs> okay. I heard that from some people. <laughs> um, just kind of high stress, high energy. Uh, yeah, not a whole lot of chill. But I guess just breathing, listening, being able to take in your surroundings and other people giving you advice versus if you're all the time just – stressing about, you know, what you are trying to order or what you're, you know, trying to do with the patient, I guess you're not really learning in that point. Mm -hmm. If you just stop for a second, you ask the person next to you, like, hey, what do you think about this? I guess knowing that you can ask for somebody else's advice is crucial. Yeah. You don't have to have all the answers right away. Yeah. And, and really ever, honestly, I mean, you, there's always more to learn. Right. Um, I do see that a lot with new grads that, that want to have arrived, so to speak, and they're, they don't want to ask or they just assume they know the answer and it's wrong. Mm -hmm. And so then if you're there corrected, it's almost insulting. And that's a terrible way to go because, uh, it's only going to create problems for you. So, mm -hmm. all right, chill. I like it. Chill. Chill. Yeah. What else you got? Um, establish a support system. So find mentors, essentially. Um, the first day that I walked in to the ER at West, I think it was like my first shift. And the doc that was on came right up to me and said, you know, we're so glad to have you on the team. Mm. And that's like, oh, 
That's awesome. Yeah. And he said, if you want to do procedures or if you want to see the higher acuity patients or if you need help with anything, don't be afraid to ask. Awesome. That is phenomenal. Can I be on with that guy all the time? <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Cool. So yeah. Very uh, cool. Okay. So a mentor and um, how, how much interaction did you have with that person? I mean, as you grew, I mean, you had had experience when you got here, but mm -hmm. How much um, guidance did you ask for? I guess I should ask. So I ask for guidance every time I'm on shift with him. <laughs> oh, is that right? Yeah. And I mean, there are a bunch of doctors that I work with right now that are just really supportive. You know, you essentially, I have my patients, they're mine, but their names are always on the chart. Mm -hmm. And so they open themselves up. Like if you have any questions, if you have any doubt, if you want me to look at a rash, Sure. Some people will roll their eyes at me first, but yeah, they'll come look at the rash. Right, right. Cool. All right. You have a good group. Yeah, for mm -hmm. sure. In case any of them are listening. <laughs> <laughs> They're all great. We yeah. love you all. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. We do too. Um, good. Any other advice that you'd give yourself? So this was the last one. Um, don't get caught up in the negativity in the office. There's always office politics or drama or, yeah. you know, negativity with, yeah, like the old crotchety people there, there are going to be negative people out there. Um, but instead of, you know, contributing to the complaining, I try to make a point to not complain about anything that I can't change. Mm. If it's going to come out of my mouth, if it's something that I'm complaining about, it's because there are, there can be a resolution to it. Yeah. So That's smart. why even why waste say your breath? anything? Yeah. yeah. If you if, can't, if you, if you can't, can't change. Yeah. If you're not part of the problem or part of the solution, mm -hmm just leave it alone. And mm -hmm. there's a lot of venting, you know, there's a lot of, and there's a place for venting, right? I, I mean, there's, there's a place for, I just got to get this off my chest, mm -hmm. but there's a time limit to venting too. Mm -hmm. So come to me, tell me that you've got a problem, vent, you know, call someone names or whatever for two minutes and then we're done and then move on. And then it shouldn't ever, what kills me is the, the gossip and mm -hmm. like the discussion about, Oh, did you hear this? Say they said this or this, that doesn't do anything for anybody. Not so, constructive. And yeah. it's, you know, it is enticing, honestly, because especially as a new graduate or a new hire somewhere, you want to be part of the team. Mm -hmm. You don't want to be the square that doesn't, you know, participate in that, but it's so much better for you, for your integrity and your professionalism if you just are above that. So mm -hmm. good call. I like it. All right. Well, that's all the time we've got. Um, I am going to have Teresa back again one more time um, because she's also pursuing something different that we will, or in addition, not different, but uh, to augment her um, profession. So I, I'm excited to talk with her about that, but we'll come back to that. But thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. All right. See you. All right, there you have it, folks. That was my conversation with Teresa Broder for a day in the life of emergency medicine. Uh, such great information, uh, great tips at the end there too for you. So definitely mark those down. Um, I just, it, it's so great to have good, solid people like Teresa in the profession, and she's always a pleasure to talk to. So uh, we will see her again at some point where we can talk about her doctorate uh, studies that she's pursuing right now, which is uh, um, getting to be a hotter topic in the PA world. So we will get to that soon. Uh, again. And show notes for this episode are going to be at pastartup.co slash episode 29. And I thank you so much for your time. Thanks for letting me hang out with you for a little bit. If you have questions about your journey uh, up to, during, uh, after PA school, hit me up. Questions at pastartup.co. I'd be more than happy to talk with you back and forth. I had some great emails from people uh, that will make for a good Q&A episode coming up here soon. Uh, so yeah. Hey, uh, subscribe to the podcast if you haven't already so that new episodes are delivered to your device. And again, check out uh, pastartup.co slash audible if you want to help us out and support us a little bit. Uh, and then, of course, hit the website up for some free resources, uh, essay workbooks, stuff like that. So thanks much, guys. Have a great week, and we'll talk to you soon.